Gaming America here. We're speaking with Bill Miller, the president and CEO of the American Gaming Association. Thank you for speaking with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Quite all right, our pleasure. Uh, my first question, we're here at G2E. Can you just tell the audience what is the significance of G2E for the industry and what purpose does it serve? Well, certainly G2E is the, it, this is the global gaming center of the world. And if you want to see what's new and exciting in the gaming industry, this is where you come. And what we've been so excited about this year, um, and we're now day two, um, day two of the show, we're seeing, you know, extraordinary participation both on the from the exhibitors as well as uh, the buyers and the visitors and so uh, yesterday was an extraordinary day we think we did more than had more than 20,000 people come through the through the gates and I think that we'll have probably a similar day today so um, it is the place where um, whether you are a manufacturer um, or you are a purchaser and you're running a casino this is the place where you want to come and see the, the latest and greatest new technology, new games, new payments methods and other things. And so uh, it is amazing to be here. We had uh, 13,000 last year um, at G2E and we were excited about it because we had you know, just come through COVID and uh, we were able to have a show, but we were, had to have a show that had masks and vaccination requirements and we had really no business travelers and no certainly no international travel because of all of the restrictions to come into the country so this year it's doors are wide open the doors of the of the country are wide open uh harry reed airport is filled to the brim with people coming not just from the u.s but from all over the world yeah. indeed it's been a it's been a very crowded crowded convention center yeah. Uh, well, moving on, <clears throat> I wanted to ask, uh, what markets do you see opening up in the coming year, both uh, just around the United States? Well, I think that, um, you know, it's incredible to think back about, you know, it wasn't that long ago when, you know, we're sitting here in Las Vegas, Nevada, that this was really the only place in America that had casino gambling, right? And now we're in 44 states around the country and then as sports betting and iGaming continue to grow these new verticals are continuing to create new opportunities in different states and so it's really quite amazing to think back that it wasn't that long ago when the industry was very very small and to see now how popular gaming has become in all of these different states whether it be you know, at, you know, resort style casino gambling or, you know, iCasinos or sports betting, which we're now in, I think, 36 states plus the District of Columbia. So what's next? I mean, you know, we've still got some big states out there that, um, you know, whether it's states like Texas and um, Georgia and certainly in the sports betting space, um, California. So. Indeed, indeed. I wanted to ask a bit about iGaming. Um, it's, sports betting has become regulated much quicker than iGaming. Do you see that tide turning? How is iGaming going to catch up? Well, I, I think it's, it, it, quite frankly, it, it, it goes to how the American gaming system is, is designed. It is a state-by-state -state, uh, process. And so the individual stakeholders within those states those are the ones that make the de those determinations. And it is, you know, every bit of lobbying and politics and trying to understand, you know, where people think iGaming fits in an already existing gaming landscape. And so uh, my view is iGaming is a very fast growing segment in the six or seven states that, we're in, that it is in today, but it hasn't moved as quickly as sports betting. And so there is a question of when and whether individual states will move forward on iGaming, but I think it should be left up to the individual states and the stakeholders that are in those states to make those determinations. Sure, sure. Uh, I wanted to ask, it's state by state, do you, as you're the sort of the main rep of the industry in Washington, yep. and do you see any hints that the federal government is taking an interest in any regulation of gaming, and what would be your stance on that? 
Um, well, look, I, I think PASPA is the best, is, the, is exhibit A for why the federal government should principally stay out of the, the gaming industry. Um, what the federal government did through PASPA was enable an illegal marketplace to flourish for decades. And finally, that has been rectified. And so we think that the 4,000 plus regulators that work every day to make sure that gaming is safe and regulated and taxed appropriately, when with all of the appropriate consumer protections, is the right way to regulate this industry. And so, look, the federal government, look, I think that our partnership with the federal government on issues like money laundering and KYC, um, our partnerships with the IRS, Treasury, Department of Justice, uh, are all really important. But we don't think that Congress should never get into the business of regulating the gambling industry um, because they've done it in the past and it has really hurt the industry and most importantly it's hurt the consumer so I don't see it as a threat on the horizon I don't see it as a um, something that there is a very much interest in and so we intend to keep it that way sure sure um, and as you've been observing states going live with sports betting or iCasino would you say that gambling is a bipartisan issue, one of the few ones around these days? <laughs> it is. So, you know, like I've, I've spent most of my life in, uh, in politics or government and generally in some way, shape or form been on one side or the other and with a very defined other side. Um, it's really nice to be in a business that's by and large bipartisan. Um, you know, we have Republican governors and Democrat governors that feel very strongly and favorably about the gaming industry because they know what we mean to their to their communities in which that are in the states and so i think that it is very refreshing for someone like myself um, who spent a lot of time up on capitol hill and in washington and it's not it's certainly not that washington is the most partisan or politicized place but it's you'd be hard pressed to find a state that has is anywhere as partisan and a polarized as Washington DC but when we talk about our industry you know I can pull an equal number of Republicans and Democrats whether they be in state legislatures governors attorney generals who are very supportive of our industry because when we came into being when someone passed legislation to allow for casino gambling or sports betting some people expressed worry and concern and said, well, what is this going to mean? Is this going to be troublesome? Or, uh, and we said, no, we're going to be great community partners and we're going to create a lot of jobs and we're going to go into those places that have been depressed and we're going to help rebuild them economically. And we've done that in every single place that we've ever been. And so I think that the story that we have to tell is echoed by those politicians, whether they be Republicans or Democrats, that when we come into the state and we create these jobs and, and positive economic uh, impact in these communities and we pay a lot of money in taxes that we are good for the communities and states that we're in. It's nice to know there's still hope for the Republic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask about illegal gambling. Sure. How prevalent is it and what measures can be taken to eradicate it? Or not eradicate it, but lessen. <sighs> Look, the, the, the illegal gambling market is probably the greatest threat to regulated gaming in, the, in America today. And I, and I define that as, you know, offshore online websites that are principally iGaming and sports betting. And, and we're, what are we trying to do, right? We, we, had an inv we had a country where the only place you could legally bet on sports in America was Nevada until PASPA was repealed. And so now we are creating a nascent market and we want to make sure that we protect that nascent market and grow it and move people from the unprotected illegal marketplace to one in which has consumer protections and responsible gaming is baked into um, sports betting and iGaming in the regulated legal marketplace. And then on these skill-based gray market machines that really, quite frankly, are popping up all over the place. They look, feel, and act just like a slot machine, but they're not regulated, no taxes are paid, no jobs are created, and they most importantly 
don't have any consumer protections. And so, you know, whether it's vulnerable populations or children, there are, you know, many, many examples of these machines that are growing all across the country, places like Pennsylvania and Virginia and other places where um, we really need law enforcement to step up and do their job to help us maintain and strengthen the legal marketplace and protect consumers and their constituents. Sure, sure. <clears throat> um, moving on a bit, I wanted to ask about uh, tax regimes. Yep. Uh, as states go live, some states opt for low tax regimes, others like New York's 51%, I believe. Yes. Uh, what's your view, what, what is the AGA's stance on how high the taxes should be? And wouldn't, uh, isn't there the fear that with high tax regimes it'll cut into the profitability of these uh, you know, companies? Well, I, I, look, I, I think that tax regime matters. I think that it is important for legislatures as they are crafting legislation around sports betting, iGaming, you know, casino gambling, that they take into consideration that an illegal market, a robust illegal market exists. And if you make the tax rates too high, if you make the regulatory burden so difficult, people will continue to use the illegal marketplace. And that is not generally the intent of legislators who are trying to legalize gaming in their state. And so what we try and do is, is make sure that people recognize and understand that as you build out legislation, when you have a prohibitively high tax rate, you may be successful early, but you may well see a, you know, the customers that flock to the legal market start to do comparative shopping. And when they start to look at comparative websites, then they say, you know, the odds that I get in the illegal market are better because the legal operator's got to pay a higher tax rate, has higher regulatory compliance costs, none of which the illegal market has. So uh, my view is it is important for legislators to recognize that they are not passing legislation in a vacuum and that if they create prohibitive tax rates, then either other states might benefit or clearly the illegal market will be able to take advantage of that. Uh, in terms of illegal, uh, the illegal market, I was wondering what, uh, actually moving on, I, I would like to ask about Europe and the, uh, the responsible, they've had issues with responsible gaming in Europe. Uh, what lessons can be learned from the European experience and applied to the U.S. in terms of encouraging responsible gaming? I think it's a very good question. Um, I think that one of the things that we've talked about since the repeal of PASPA is getting sports betting right because it is, uh, it's very easy to see those cautionary tales, whether it be the U.K. or Spain or Italy or Australia, places where you know, advertising went out of control, sponsorship and marketing, um, you know, and, and the lack of responsibility being baked into the marketing and offerings. It's one of the reasons why at the AGA, we created a responsible sports betting, sports betting marketing and advertising code for all of our members to adopt. It's another reason why we created our own PSA campaign called Have a Game Plan, Bet Responsibly. We did it not to make any money. We did it because we thought it was important for, you know, the, the sports betting operators, but most, but even more importantly, what I call all of our new business partners, whether it's the leagues, whether it's teams, arenas, broadcasters, all of these entities are seeing the financial benefit of sports betting but we also want them to ha own the responsibility piece of this too. This is a great opportunity to allow consumers to bet in a safe and regulated marketplace, but there is responsibility that comes with that for all of our business partners. The sports betting operators, it's part of our license. You know, it can be taken away from us, but we need to make sure that broadcasters and stadiums and teams and leagues share that. And Quite frankly, um, they have. 
you know, we've got 30 plus partners, including, you know, uh, you know, recently announced deals with uh, Major League Baseball and PGA and, you know, uh, many, many leagues, arenas, broadcasters that have adopted our PSA campaign because they recognize we have a, this is a shared imperative and one in which it is quite important for us to not go down that path that others like UK and Spain, et cetera, went down. Yeah, you can see that these companies can be their own worst enemy, I suppose. Um, has there been, last question, has there been resistance against the AGA's measures to uh, encourage? Not, not really. I th I'd say that you know, to the degree there's been any resistance, it's really been more about the education process. And, and that's something that we've spent a lot of time, our team has spent a lot of time going out and doing meetings with the leagues and meeting with teams and figuring out you know, who within particular league or broadcaster are the leading voices and trying to get to them about and understanding what it is we need to do to encourage the right kind of introduction of sports betting into whatever medium it is, whether it's television or online or in-stadium uh, advertising and marketing. And so I think that um, it hasn't been resistance as much as education. Gotcha. Well, thanks for speaking with us. This has been Bill Miller, the President and CEO of the American Gaming Association. Thank you.